We'd like to welcome Leticia dos Santos Pereira from the Universidad Federal de Bahia from Brazil, uh, who's going to talk to us. Uh, the title of the, of the talk is a Nobel Prize for a textbook, Wilhelm Ostwald's Pedagogy and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So I welcome you to, to, uh, to the conference and thank you very much for your presentation in advance. If you like, I will interrupt you 10 minutes before the end of your talk. You're, you're given one hour or, and then I'll just warn you that you have 10 minutes left and then we have 10 minutes for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy and honored to be here. I watched some lectures on YouTube channel this week, and I'm very pleased and uh, with so many relevant uh, contributions to think philosophy of chemistry. And uh, I am to say that I am to thank, uh, I need to thank uh, the ISPC organization committee and in special Dr. Maria Martinez Ordaz for the personal invitation. Well, my talk today is based on a paper published recently in Ambex Journal, which was part of my PhD thesis concerning Ostwald's contributions to chemical education and the impact of these works on his candidacy uh, for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, I would like to start stressing the relevance of philosophical and historical knowledge to facing the challenge of science pedagogy. I am not a philosopher of chemistry, but it's not, it's not necessary to be a philosopher to recognize how important is the philosophy of chemistry for understanding the logical structure of the science. The philosophical reflections impact chemistry teaching and curriculum. Moreover, uh, the philosophy of chemistry also contributes to the understanding of the role of scientific models in teaching and the relationship between reality and representation. These important reflections impact, um, impact the practices of chemistry educators around the world. In turn, we historians of chemistry try to understand how chemical knowledge was built, disseminated, and reformulated by people in different socio-historical contexts. And this is fundamental for chemistry teachers. Without historical research, it is not possible to think of a contextual approach for chemistry teaching as proposed by Michael Matthews. I believe these simple examples show us the strong relationship among philosophy, history, and chemistry teaching. And they show us how science pedagogy is a very complex activity that mobilizes different kinds of knowledge and present important elements for the analysis of historians and philosophers. For this reason, I will start talking about science pedagogy. And as we know, science pedagogy plays a fundamental role in the organization, transmission, and standardization of science, as well as in the dissemination of scientific cultures and the formation of a professional identity. Um, by studying the teaching practice, textbooks, and other elements of pedagogical work, Historians have shown how science pedagogy spreads theories, methods, values, and forms of representation and communication in science. But despite its relevance, science pedagogy is sometimes portrayed as a lower status activity, a kind of work that diverts scientists' attention away from research. And I think it's not difficult to find in our everyday life in academy 
and also in history of chemistry, uh, comments from scientists about the burden of the teaching that is on their research. Well, but this is not a point of view based on my personal um, experience or historical anecdotes. There are important works stressing the problematic nature of science pedagogy. The philosopher Thomas Kuhn, for example, made comments on teaching that could be considered pejoratives. Kuhn considered research and teaching as almost divergent activities, while research was about solving the puzzles of normal science and dealing with growing anomalies teaching was present as a constant indoctrination of beginners to the crystallized foundations of normal science. And science textbooks were the main instrument, according to Thomas Kahn, of this indoctrination. To some extent, we historians of science also reinforce these views. Although we recognize the relevance of textbooks for disseminating knowledge and maintaining a scientific community, textbooks are sometimes considered the last existential act of science, since they are often portrayed as dogmatic and conservative, presenting only consensual knowledge and hiding the dynamics of science in their narratives. And despite the value, um, its value for science, uh, the writing of textbooks is still being present as an uncreative and secondary activity, a kind of dirty job, but one that someone has to do. Well, I think that this traditional view of science textbooks and science pedagogy in general fends in Wilhelm Ostwald's case at least a counter example. And I believe that everybody here knows at least a little about Wilhelm Ostwald. And I need to say that I, uh, that I, I am very anxious to be here talking about Ostwald because many other brilliant historians wrote about him and his legacy. Um, I, could, I could mention uh, Regina Zott, Fred Schultz, Erwin Wilbert, Hans Gunther Korbe, Peter Domschke, Albert J. Deltet, and many others. And for these reasons, I think it's unnecessary to present Ostwald in detail here in this conference. I will just remind you about Ostwald's many-sided chemical investigations, such as his works on catalysis, electrochemistry, and chemical equilibrium, and the many devices and methods he developed or improved, such as the viscosimeter and pycnometer. Ostwald also was a strong spokesman, spokesman of uh, theories developed by Svante Arrhenius and Jacobus Enricus van Hoff, who were Ostwald's personal friends and scientific partners. And I believe it's unnecessary to talk about Ostwald's energetics and his rejection to atomic theory too. I think that everybody here knows at least a little uh, about Ostwald's rejection to atomic theory and his adoption of an energy-based worldview in the last decade of 19th century. And this change made him reject uh, atomism until 1908, when he recognized the value of evidence in favor to atomic theory. Well, but maybe few people here knows uh, that Ostwald was a prolific writer and one of the most important chemical educators at the turn of the 20th century, responsible directly and indirectly for the training of young physical chemists 
who developed and spread this field in several countries around the world. And I say direct, uh, directly and indirectly, because Ostwald was not only a supervisor, a teacher or a lecturer, but also because he was responsible for writing many relevant chemistry textbooks used by scientists worldwide. Well, Ostwald's reputation as a chemical educator was so relevant that his nominators for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry considered this activities prize worthy. Ostwald was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry from 1904 from, uh, until 1909, when he was finally awarded. His nominators had highlighted some of his experimental works and improvements, but in most nomination letters, these kinds of achievements were present just superficially. On the other hand, most of Ostwald's nominators presented in details his efforts to promote and institutionalize physical chemistry including his pedagogical accomplishments, such as his work as a textbook writer. And concerning Ostwald textbooks, neither of them was so relevant nor popular among his nominators, like the Lehrbuch der Allgemeinen Chemie. Well, uh, the Lehrbuch was Ostwald's first textbook. Its first edition was published in two volumes, Stoichiometry and Verwandtschaftslehre. The second edition, expanded and revised, was published in three parts, Stoichiometry, Chemischen Energie, and Verwandtschaftslehre. This last one was published in small parts between 1896 and 1902. On the appreciation of this book, 12 out of the 15 nominators mentioned the Lehrbuch as an example of Ostwald contributions to chemistry. Some of them considered this textbook as one of Ostwald's main achievements. But we need to ask, uh, why was this book considered so special by these nominators? What characteristics of this textbook justify these opinions? And finally, how did the Nobel Prize Committee evaluate the claim that Oswald should be awarded for the writing of a textbook? Well, I will try today <laughs> answer these questions. Um, well, Oswald's nominators mentioned Lehrbuch for many reasons. Uh, one of these reasons was the systematization of chemical knowledge presented in the Lehrbuch. And uh, in 1907, four scientists from the University of Christiania sent a joint nomination letter in favor to Ostwald. This group was formed by the uh, geologists Waldemar Brugge, um, Thornstein Riordal, Johann Vogt, and the chemist Heinrich Goldschmidt. Uh, for them, Ostwald should be awarded for his contributions to the dissemination of physical chemistry, as amplified by his Lehrbuch and other textbooks. Concerning the Lehrbuch, the scientists from Christiania defended that it was a comprehensive codification of the results of physical chemistry and far from just enumerating said results, it also thoroughly and critically evaluates them and at the same time presents many brilliant ideas for further works. Well, this is the opinion of these nominators. We need to evaluate it if this makes sense. And 
well, as I previously said, uh, Lehrbuch was Ostwald's first textbook. It was written when Ostwald was a young chemistry student at the University of Dorpa in Estonia, today University of Tartu. In his autobiography, Ostwald was unclear about his motivation to, to write a textbook. For a young and ambitious chemist like him, far from the main centers of chemical research of the 19th century, uh, writing a textbook was a way to gain prestige and maybe obtain a paid position at a university. However, um, his motivation did not appear to be only ambition. Uh, Ostwald was dissatisfied with some of the textbooks available at the time. He considered uh, these textbooks outdated or more like a compilation of papers than a didactic synthesis of chemical knowledge. Well, but Ostwald considered that the systematization and synthesis of knowledge would enable the emergence of new knowledge. But this opinion, however, um, uh, was not shared by Ostwald mentors, Carl Schmidt and Johann Lemberg. According to Ostwald mentors, neither of them, um, according to Ostwald, sorry, uh, his mentors did not recognize the value of advance of knowledge, of ordering and summarizing what was known, although there were numerous examples where the publication of a textbook had brought the results from disparate areas into contest and had often made the development of the field possible. On the other hand, Ostwald recognized this and considered the success of the Lehrbuch an example of the value of systematization of knowledge. And despite the viewpoint of Schmidt and Lemberg, Ostwald continued to draft his book. Uh, the first volume of Lehrbuch uh, was published when Ostwald was professor at Riga Polytechnic School. In the foreword, he explains his intentions to, to readers, namely to present an overview of physical chemistry, or rather, general chemistry, since the importance of this area has been recognized for the further development of the science. And I believe it's necessary to say that the relationship between general chemistry and physical chemistry presented by Ostwald was not trivial. First, Ostwald general chemistry was not limited to the studying of the composition of matter using physical properties and methods. As shown by many previous textbooks. For Ostwald, general chemistry was a set of principles and techniques used to describe and understand any chemical change. Ostwald believed that the new physical chemistry showed the light the study of chemical composition with the search of physical principles and general laws that describes chemical change. And finally, it's important to say uh, that the idea made explicit here in this forward, even not so emphatically, is that physical chemistry is the most fundamental area of chemistry, and therefore the most important area for the comprehension of the science. Well, uh, regarding the contents, Ostwald organized his Lehrbuch around central subjects. The first volume 
focuses on the stoichiometric relations and the determination of atomic weights and the properties of matter in its different physical states. It also presents discussions concerning the nature of matter, such as atomic theory, molecular theory, the equivalent approach, and the periodical laws. In the second volume, Ostwald focuses on chemical change, giving special attention to chemical affinity. The subject of his first investigations uh, was chemical affinity. And for this reason, Ostwald present how, uh, his own works on the subject in his textbook. But he also present other works developed by young and ethno scientists, such as Sivan Tiarrhenius, who was at the time searching for support for his controversial thesis on the conductivity of electrolytes. Moreover, Ostwald also recog uh, organized the contents of this book into chapter groups that uh, represent areas between chemistry and physics, such as thermochemistry, electrochemistry, and mechanical chemistry and photochemistry, stressing their contribution to the comprehension and determination of chemical affinity. But it's important to say that other textbooks had tried organize chemistry in a similar way, uh, such as Josias Koch elements of chemical physics. But no one of these previous textbooks had publ uh, was published in, uh, in such a favorable contest, uh, such as Lerbourg. Many relevant discoveries and theories later linked to physical chemistry appeared or came to the forefront between the late of 1870s and 1880s. Ostwald was able to include these novelties scattered in chemical journals and his textbook. In addition, the creation of institutional spaces for physical chemistry, such as the uh, laboratories and chairs at universities and the needs of chemical industry contributed to the growing interest in physical chemistry. Therefore, Lerbourg can also be regarded as a portrait of the development of physical chemistry at the time. Um, but a textbook not just organizes knowledge, but also disseminated knowledge to uh, audience. Ostwald nominators recognized this element and we stressed uh, Lerbourg role in the popularization of physical chemistry and the creation of a community of practitioners who met new methods, approaches, and theories through Ostwald book. For example, the chemist Hans Landau appointed Ostwald in 1908 for two reasons. The dilution law established by Ostwald at the beginning of his career and the writing of the Lerbourg, considered by Landau as an essential cause for the astonishing upswing which general chemistry took since 1890s. Um, and indeed, Oswald textbook seemed to res uh, be responsible for introducing and spread physical chemistry to different circles. Not only chemists, chemistry, chemists, sorry, but also geologists, pharmacists, and physicists, and other representatives of diverse disciplines learn about physical chemistry with Ostwald textbooks. 
However, it's difficult to consider just Lerbeau as responsible for spreading physical chemistry. Despite its singular approach and popularity, the Lerbeau was never fully translated into other languages. It was just partially translated uh, to English under the title Solutions. <laughs> On the other hand, Ostwald's second textbook, the Grundriss der Allgemeinen Chemie, was continuously reprinted and translated into several languages, such as English, French, Russian, Japanese, Spanish, and many others. In the Grundriss, Ostwald introduced for the first time the relevant electrolytic dissociation theory published by Arrhenius in 1887, as well Van Hoff thermodynamic studies. In the Grundriss, Ostwald also present his dilution law published in 1888. However, few nominators mentioned the Grundriss uh, in their nomination letters. Despite the, the relevance of this book for spreading these new ideas of physical chemistry. For the nominators, Lerbo seems to be Ostwald's most important and successful textbook. And I believe these opinions are related to the pedagogical strategies adopted by Ostwald in the Lerbo. Um, the nominators, some of the nominators, recognized Ostwald's pedagogical approach. The pharmacist Hermann Thoms, for example, claimed that Ostwald was able to include a pedagogical element in the development of science. Moreover, Ostwald's didactic strategies were highlighted by other nominators, such as Arthur Neues, James Walker and Emil Constant, who affirmed that Ostwald developed the teaching method, uh, the teaching and the methods of physical chemistry. But we need to ask what were the characteristics of Ostwald's pedagogical approach? Well, uh, one of these characteristics was his belief that textbooks should present chemistry using a clear and simple language and following a narrative that allows students to understand it despite the complexity of the subjects. This simplicity was possible because Ostwald recognized the pedagogical role of the textbooks. He was worried about the goals, audience, and amount of chemical knowledge that should be present for students. And in a 1904 essay on the history of chemistry textbooks, Ostwald criticized many, uh, that many textbooks assumed that students had a prior contact with the contents. And moreover, Ostwald defended that it was necessary to distinguish textbooks from other kind of writings, such as handbooks. And about the difference between textbooks and handbooks pointed out by Ostwald, I would like to read this quotation. A handbook should summarize the existing knowledge as completely and precisely as possible. The textbook that introduces the beginner to science must be of a completely different nature. Completeness is necessarily and naturally waived. On the other hand, the continuity and coherence of the presentation are fundamental. There is the great difficulty here, which lies with the, uh, in the one dimensional nature of time. This establishes the necessity that only one other thing 
can ever follow a given thing in the lecture. In every science, however, the individual things are not in a simple, but in a multiple relationship. And the poorly linear development of the thread is terribly impossible. The teacher must go back again and again to retie broken threads. Well, I believe this quotation provides an excellent example of, of Oswald's view of teaching activity and the uh, complex role of textbooks. But this quotation also raised a question. How could the teacher retie these broken threads? And for Ostwald, the answer was using historical narratives to present the contents. Ostwald believed that the history of chemistry reflected the logical development of the science. And thus, this would be the most appropriate way to organize and present chemical knowledge. According to Ostwald, the historical approach was a method or a tool which may help in reaching a scientific understanding of certain questions. And I must to stress that Ostwald's defense of the use of history of chemistry in chemistry teaching was quite different from those we defended today. Um, Ostwald believed that the history of chemistry reflected the logical development of the science as a progressive march from speculative knowledge to an increasingly objective, complex, and general knowledge. And this linear presentation of development of science is not, is not considered by, by uh, the science educators today a positive way to present history of chemistry and teaching. And besides the history of chemistry, Ostwald also made his philosophical conceptions clear for the readers and in some cases used his philosophical beliefs as an heuristic tool to organize chemistry. And now I would like to open a parenthesis about this. Obviously, uh, we cannot consider Ostwald a philosopher of chemistry. This would be a kind of anachronism. However, uh, we could consider him a chemist philosopher, or at least a chemist uh, that consciously uh, applied philosophy in his science. Ostwald's philosophy was built not only by energetics, but also present elements of phenomenology and the positivism of Auguste Comte and Ernest Mach. Moreover, Ostwald philosophical approach was not ignored by the nominators. For example, the, uh, Hermann Thoms called Ostwald as a scientific philosophy writer. And the American chemist Theodore Richards uh, considered that if the prize may be given for general influence on chemical thought, and for the philosophical grasp of the subject, Ostwald should be chosen as a prize winner. Um, Ostwald's philosophical approach is perceptible in some of his books. In the first edition of Lehrbuch, Ostwald's philosophical beliefs uh, appeared subtly in his discussion about the, the nature of matter and the chemical phenomena. However, after Ostwald's conversion to energetics, 
his new worldview drastically impacted his research and his Lehrbuch too. In the second edition of this textbook, Ostwald tried to present chemistry from an energeticist perspective using energeticist concepts and notations and presenting the foundations of chemical energetics in his book. My research uh, did not focus on the presence of energetics in Ostwald textbooks, but I desired in, uh, in the future to, to investigate this subject. But this initial approximation permits us to perceive a relevant feature in Ostwald writing style namely the inclusion of new and contentious scientific ideas into his textbooks. And it also provides a counterexample to the view of textbooks as places of normal science, distant from scientific novelties and controversies. Well, uh, I believe it's necessary now to discuss how the Nobel Prize Committee received and evaluated the arguments of Ostwald nominators. Uh, firstly, I need to explain that Nobel Prize choices are not exactly democratic choices. And uh, I believe that the historian Elizabeth Crawford discussed uh, uh, brilliantly, uh, this the the prize decision making in this textbook. So um, I will not um, detail the the process of choices and Nobel Prize, but I need to say that in the first years there was a complex decision making system which was described by uh, Crawford in detail. And it's important to say that the most supported candidate can be, but cannot be elected as prize winner. Uh, moreover, there are uh, statutory rules for each prize. According to Nobel Prize Statute for the Chemistry Prize, um, uh, this prize was to be granted to those who had recently made relevant discoveries or improvements in this area. However, the notions of recent and improvement left much to, to interpretation. And I believe that this openness permitted the, the indication of achievements far from those expected by the committees. Finally, as discussed by Elizabeth Crawford and other historians, the analysis of candidates and the decision making of the committees had a subjective aspect that underlies the personal motivations of the nominators and the members of the academy. This is the case, for example, of Svante Arrhenius, who uh, frequently Preclude, precluded rivals and favored friends in the Nobel Prize decisions, as I will mention next. Um, well, um, returning to Ostwald, a talk his role as a textbook writer was considered by his supporters to be one of his most important contributions to chemistry. These works were not contemplated in the prize statute. In the 1904 report, the chemistry committee stressed that there can be no doubt that Ostwald above others should be considered in the uh, award assessment if the prize was offered to writing about, writings about the development of the science of chemistry in general. Between 1905 
and 1908, Oswald candidacy continued to be rejected by the Nobel Committee due to his work being uh, his works being beyond the scope of the prize. However, uh, the nominators repeatedly uh, presented textbooks, his teaching activity, and other kinds of works uh, for the spreading of physical chemistry as reasons to our Ostwald. For example, the American chemist Arthur Noyes defended that Ostwald should be prized for the sum of his work as researcher, writer, and educator, and concluded his letter by affirming that a man who has contributed and so marked a degree to the systematization and distinction of a body of knowledge is no less deserving of the highest scientific recognition than is the original discoverer of an important principle. Well, um, however, Neue's opinion and the opinion of other nominators did not change Oswald's situation. Uh, just after Ostwald's acceptance to atomic theory and consequently Arrhenius' intervention in the Swedish Academy, the appreciation of Ostwald's candidacy changed. Despite the old friendship, Arrhenius did not support Ostwald in the Nobel Prize decisions until 1909. According to Elizabeth Crawford, the reason was Ostwald's rejection to atomism. Only after Ostwald openly assumed the value of atomic theory in 1909 did he receive Arrhenius' support for the Nobel Prize. Arrhenius helped Ostwald behind the scenes at the Academy backstage machinations, helped by another, mem uh, another member of the Academy and member of the chemistry committee, the chemist Oscar Wildman. Arrhenius neutralized arguments against Ostwald at the committee meetings, such as the idea that Ostwald was more a writer or teacher than a researcher. And the strategy, as we know, worked well, and the acknowledgement of Ostwald as an educator was minimized in favor of his research on catalysis. And he was finally awarded in 1909. Well, um, I would like to conclude my presentation um, by stressing that Oswald pedagogical efforts compressed uh, contrast with the usual image of science pedagogy as a dogmatic and conservative activity. His lehrbuch so, shows us... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, you have, you have 10 more minutes? I think that's okay, okay. right? Because we're starting your conclusion, so it's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, his lehrbuch shows us that pedagogical work can help us to analyze science best from a different perspective that highlights the different ways to transmit, reproduce, and rebuild science. Looking at the writing of textbooks, it's possible to perceive how the transmission of knowledge is a very complex activity that demands a large comprehension of scientific knowledge and its relation with other disciplinary fields. Moreover, a textbook is not a neutral writing, but a materialization of the worldview, the science view, and the pedagogical perspectives of an author. For this reason, it's necessary for a textbook writer to analyze what didactic strategies can contribute to his or her presentation of contents and make his or her ontological and epistemological perspectives clear to the readers. 
And I believe it, that Ostwald was able to make this in his Lehrbuch. Finally, it's necessary to highlight uh, the need for a deeper analysis of the role of science textbooks and science pedagogy in general. Only further investigations of more case studies can indicate uh, whether Ostwald's case is exemplary or unique. However, the acknowledgement of Oswald pedagogical work by his Nobel Prize nominators is at least a reason to reappraise the value of science pedagogy in different historical contexts. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was, that was perfect timing. And we can now open the floor for questions. I'm sure that there will be many questions because it was a very interesting talk. So Alfonso has a question. Yes, and uh, congratulations, um, um, Leticia, because very interesting thing you talk about the pedagogical dimension of, um, of uh, you know, uh, of, of chemistry, which is sometimes neglected in this uh, uh, discussions, which is very good. But at the same time, you talk about the Nobel Prize and decision making uh, for this prize. I think this is a very interesting area. And it's, as you mentioned there, there is subjectivity and personal interest in the uh, award of a certain Nobel Prize in a certain year. So this uh, raises a uh, a very important uh, philosophical problem for the Nobel Prize, which means, uh, I mean by this, that uh, the decision is made by a committee. I mean, very well-known scientists, if you want to, but it's a committee. It's a group of uh, individuals who have certain preferences, certain view about science, and this is important, the importance of a certain uh, discovery or research. And uh, this is raises the philosophical problem because uh, in general, there is not such a thing as the importance meter. If you understand what I'm trying to say, there's not an instrument, uh, objective instrument that measures the importance of a certain discovery. In general, in chemistry, uh, that's my uh, point of view, all the contributions of all the chemists around the world are important. So uh, this is just my opinion about this and I, uh, really uh, like your talk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I'm very happy for your comments. And uh, uh, it, normally, usually, uh, we consider Nobel Prize like the ethics of a scientific career, but we forget that the Nobel Prize is a choice of a very small group that did not know, uh, don't know the how science is is uh, built uh, around the world in a in a wider way. For example, um, um, we I will speak about uh, we're talking about about Brazil. Uh, there is a lot of interesting research uh, research developed uh, developing here, but uh, this this research are not so um, um, have has no impact in in the in the central places of scientific research for many reasons. It's not only a political reason. We could consider uh, other elements for our analysis. But I believe that uh, every prize is uh, unfair in some way because neglect many, uh, the contributions of many other scientists that are behind this person, uh, the denominator, uh, uh, the nominee, sorry. So thank you and, and I hope you enjoy my, my speech. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, yeah, all these prizes are very political and, and you're right to be careful and sensitive about that. Oigon. Can you hear me? 
Yes. So uh, I had three encounters with the work of Oswald. When I was a student, I learned about Oswald's theory of solution, reaction, and catalysis, and that impressed me. Then a little later, I stumbled about the famous Ostwald's classical reprints, and that also impressed me. But then I browsed through two of his very, very many uh, written books. So <clears throat> he was writing very many books, and at least the one I browsed made not a good impression on me. So uh, I remember one book was on analytical chemistry. It was written like a novel. And uh, during 100 pages, he tried to convince the reader that the atomic concept is wrong and that one could derive the laws of uh, a constant and multiple uh, proportions without the atomic concept. And after 100 pages, I could not find out where he introduced the logical mistake. So I am a bit astonished to hear now that Ostwald was famous for his teaching. So I just want to make this comment. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah, Ostwald uh, today, I believe, will not uh, uh, be present as a, a good teacher for his textbooks because uh, they are very large textbooks uh, the second edition of Lerbo, I believe, uh, some of the, the three volumes uh, had more or less um, 2,000 pages. <laughs> I believe more, 2,000 yeah. pages. It's, it's uh, incredible. But I think for the time, uh, the, the end of 19th century, uh, uh, many elements uh, contributed for, for the fame of Ostwald textbooks too. Uh, for example, Ostwald was a good uh, a good lecturer, a uh, good teacher. Um, he made some parallels between he uh, himself and the and Justus von Liebig, who was a, a great teacher, considered a great teacher too. So uh, and. Oswald have uh, had uh, uh, a large num number of students of, of um, um, people working in his lab. So I believe many other elements that escape my, my presentation and my paper too uh, helped Oswald to reach this, um, this position as a great chemical educator of the 19th century. But it's curious that today, when we, we are thinking about the great chemical educators of the past, we don't remember Ostwald. We remember other names, but we don't remember Ostwald. And this is, a, it, this is problematic, I believe. But thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you. Yes, teaching is, is also it's culturally sensitive and it's time sensitive because there are different teaching styles and because the the, the um, culture of the students changes, we have to adapt our teaching and change that as well. Klaus has a question. Uh, Lucia, thank you. Um, very well done. Um, it would have been too good uh, to have um, the, the first uh, philosopher of chemistry as a Nobel Prize winner. So it's a little bit sad, as far as I'm concerned, that um, this idea is, so to say, connected with his um, con convergence to, um, to atomism. Um, that's um, just a comment. Another comment is that um, the, an introduction to all textbooks of chemistry 
this is maybe can I, can I see it really? The fundamental principles of uh, chemistry, hopefully you have seen it. Um, there's almost no uh, reference to that uh, book, but that's um, uh, written in, that is the English version from 1909. The uh, German original was from 1906. So I would be really interested whether those people who decided about the Nobel Prize saw that book. Um, I'm pretty sure that they, that they saw or read his Faraday lecture in, from 1904. Uh, and in both of them, he's uh, just um, um, writing a really um, exaggerated, so to say, um, uh, work on uh, non-atomistic chemistry, which by the way, is still there. We have still non-atomistic chemistry in, in our days. So my question would be, have you seen that um, introduction to all ke uh, chemistry textbooks? Um, uh, I did not, uh, I, I have not access of all textbooks. I worked in my, purpose, my paper, um, and special, the first edition of L'Herbourg and the second edition. Uh, but the second edition, I believe I need to make a, a more deeply analysis to understand the uh, Ostwald presentation of energetic in this book. Uh, in a first moment, I was looking just for the, the pedagogical approach of Ostwald and how this pedagogical approach was linked to Nobel Prize. But energetics is a, a important subject for me too. I, I, was, uh, I started to work about Ostwald because I believe that uh, Ostwald catalysis works are very linked, uh, were very uh, influenced by Ostwald thinking about energetics. And well, uh, yeah. this is a, a subject that I need to investigate. But about uh, the books, uh, I did not uh, read the, the other. Uh, so we don't so. agree on that point. I think energetics is not so typical for his philosophy of chemistry. But OK, that's my idea. Uh, I don't know. I need to. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's talk in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Elena, uh, Elena has a question. A moment. Um, uh, I, uh, that is not a question, uh, but uh, that is um, like comments. Excuse me, you don't see me. Um, uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, for this beautiful uh, paper, because I um, have worked in this area. I am um, uh, concerned in my lectures for students, of course, um, the figure of uh, Ostwald. Um, and I published a lot of um, um, articles, uh, unfortunately, mostly in Russian, but there are in English also, about um, Ostwald and his scientific school in physical chemistry. And uh, I can say that in laboratory of Ostwald, many um, these young scientists, it is very important that they manage to perform a research that later became um, an appreciable contribution to the development of science. And uh, there were a lot of people from different countries, you, you told us uh, also, and from Russia, I can say you, uh, all physical, um, um, all uh, schools in the physical chemistry, they uh, originated from Austria, uh, this uh, Leipzig uni uh, laboratory. Uh, and I wrote about uh, this. Uh, from here originated um, um, scientific directions of uh, a lot of uh, scientists in the world. And I would like to mention his uh, method of conducting experiments. Because, uh, and it was not in uh, your paper, but I worked in, the, in this area. Um, he uh, founded a um, special uh, firm, it was a firm Fritz Kühler, which uh, created the instrumentation. Uh, 
and um, uh, the, this firm pro uh, produced original equipment for the uh, physical chemical uh, researchers by a request of Ostwald and his disciples. And uh, moreover, his disciples did practical work in the workshops to learn self-making of measuring devices by agreement between this firm, Fritz Kühler, and Ostwald. And I wrote about, for example, his uh, disciple uh, um, Plotnikov, uh, that is uh, in photochemical uh, area. And uh, I have one project, uh, very interesting, but I don't know <laughs> when I realized it uh, in, um, in this direction. But you should um, uh, add to your uh, context also uh, this uh, side of his work, because nobody, uh, may, uh, learned his uh, um, students to create um, new equipment and to use it in experiment. Uh, for example, his disciples, uh, I wrote also, they uh, came to Moscow University and uh, his uh, this project of he organized the same practicum for his students, for example. That is uh, methodological, uh, idea of uh, Ostwald. I, I'm going to cut. Thank you, you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, these are very valuable comments, but we have to keep to the time. Khrushchev mm -hmm. has one last question. I'll ask him to ask the question, um, but but very very briefly. And Leticia, if you can answer very briefly, because then we can keep to the time. I know we started a bit late. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Very short question. Very similar ideas about connections between pedagog pedagogical work, history, and science, we can found also by Pierre Duhem. Do you know about some connections between Wilhelm Oswald and Pierre Duhem in this field? Thank you. Um... Thank you, Professor. Uh, and, and thank you, Professor Elena, for the comments. Uh, I, 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 I don't work about Pierre Duhan, but a colleague, a colleague mine from my university was researching about Pierre Duhan, and she gave me some, um, some hints about the relationship between them but I need to say I never read the, the Pierre Duhan uh, books. But I believe it's, uh, they follow, uh, follow it, uh, elements uh, common to, uh, uh, to Ernest Mar influence in science pedagogy too. Ernest Mar had a, was a mentor of science teaching in the 19th century in the end of 19th century. So I believe there are some elements in common in parallel, in parallel between Oswald and, and Duhan. But thank you for, for the, the hint, the reinforce the hint. Thank you. I will search for these books. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very nice plenary session to begin our conference today. And we should move over to Oshiro.